الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا أشهد أن محمد رسول الله أشهد أن محمد رسول الله حي على الصلاة حي على الصلاة حي على الفلاح حي على الفلاح الله أكبر الله أكبر لا السلام علیکم پیس بے پانی بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم in the name of Allah God most gracious brothers and sisters and friends I will give you the format today at first Reverend Jimmy Swaggart will begin. He will address us for 30 minutes. And then Brother Ahmed Didat will speak for 40 minutes. And finally, Reverend Jimmy Swaggart would come back to the podium to address us for another 10 minutes. We thought this would be fair and just, and they both have agreed. After that time, you, the audience, will have your opportunity to raise your questions to these speakers. We'll have one hour for questions and answers. Again, the debate. Is the Bible the Word of God? Let us, Muslims and Christians, be on our best behavior. May Allah the Almighty bless us. I bring to you Reverend Jimmy Swaggart. Thank you so very, very much. I'm so very happy to be here tonight. And even though this debate or these addresses are given by our Muslim friends, still this distinguished scholar from the world of Islam, Mr. Ahmad Didat, has come to be with us in our town. And uh, I just met Mr. Didat this afternoon, just a few minutes really, I should say this evening. And he's one of the type of gentlemen that you meet and you like him instantly. And uh, I want all of the Christians here, and of course, I know that you Muslims will join in with us, and this doesn't count on my 30 minutes. <laughs> I want us to give Mr. D. Dot a big hand of welcome of friendship to our city of Baton Rouge. He is a scholar, and I am not a Bible scholar, even though I am an avid Bible student. He was teasing my wife and I just before we came on and said, Islam allows 
four wives. He just corrected me, said, up to four. I said, well, <clears throat> Mr. D. Dot, Christianity only allows us one, so I had to get the best on the first shot. <clears throat> I am honored to be here tonight, very pleased to have this opportunity to speak a few words in respect to that which we believe to be the Word of Almighty God. I want to say something just before we get started. I have not known too very much about Islam. I do not say that with any type of pride, but I have to be honest. In the last few months, I have studied Islam somewhat, and I'll admit I've only scratched the surface. Back some, I guess it must have been about two years ago now, I made a derogatory statement over television about the Quran. If you were not listening that particular week, I'm never going to tell you what it was. But I apologize for that. And I've never done it since, and I will not do it again, because I feel that it was not the right thing to do. And after that, I've made a study a little bit, as I mentioned a moment ago, and I've learned that Muslims are some of the most hospitable people on the face of the earth. And I've learned that you are extremely, totally dedicated and serious about your faith. In other words, it's not just a sham with you. You mean business. And as our distinguished moderator said a moment ago, the two most powerful religious influences in the world today is Christianity and Islam. And I want to say at the outset that Every true Christian loves the Muslim people. And I mean that with all of my heart. I have learned to respect the Quran. I've learned to respect the Muslims. I do not believe the Quran is the Word of God. I do not believe that Mohammed was God's prophet. But I do respect your beliefs, I do respect your faith, I do respect your sincerity. Time and time again, I have, before vast television audiences, I have held up this Bible or one like it, and I'm sure most of you have seen me do it. I have done it through television to 140 countries of the world. And I have stated this is the word of Almighty God. I have stated that there is no other word of God, and we live, die, sink, or swim on this book. I believe that. I believe it with all of my heart. But of course, saying that really is cheap. Those type of words do not really cost that very much. And I want to start this out tonight by quoting a passage of Scripture that Mr. Dodd and myself disagree somewhat over, but which is one of, if not the dearest, passage in the Word of God to the world of Christendom, found in St. John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only unique Son. Fooled you there, Mr. Dodd. <laughs> his only unique Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I want to use that as the basis for this simple statement that I would attempt to make tonight. I would ask us to bow our heads as we ask God's blessings upon this effort. Heavenly Father, as we come to Thee, we ask that You would Help all of us here to conduct ourselves, as I know we shall, by your help and your grace in the way that you would desire that we do so. That every word may be for thy glory, that we may say only what you would desire, 
in the way that you would desire it. And I'll ask it all in the holy and the precious name of Jesus. And everyone said that are Christians, amen and amen. There is no Christian that will say that God wrote the Bible. God did not write the Bible. To be frank with you, the only thing that I know of that God did write was the Ten Commandments on stone for Moses. That was kept, the Decalogue, in the Ark of the Covenant for many, many centuries. But God never wrote the Word of God, the Bible. Man wrote it. The Bible meaning a library of books. Man wrote it as man was according to Simon Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Peter said, holy men of old wrote as they were moved upon, breathed upon by God, to write that which came from God. God used their personalities. He used their character. He used their consecration to Him. He even used their idiosyncrasies at times, but he used men so that his great plan for this planet, for all of humanity, could be placed in man's simple words so that man could comprehend it and man could understand it. There is no book on the face of the earth that has had the textual criticism that this book has had. I, I sort of feel insignificant when I stand here attempting to speak about the Bible when I realize that some of the world's most eminent scholars have critically looked at every single text over and over and over again, sparing no expense, no time, no effort, to ascertain if it was what it said it was. I have read the Bible through many, many, many times. And others such as I have read it many more times, much more educated than I could ever be, understanding both Hebrew and Greek. The first passages of the Bible were written about 3,500 years ago. To my knowledge, it is the oldest book of revelation on the face of the entire earth. We believe that Moses wrote what is called the Pentateuch, those first five books, with the exception possibly of the last few verses in Deuteronomy. And he could have even written that because we believe that God, and I know Islam believes, that God is so powerful that he could have revealed to Moses exactly how he would die and exactly how that his funeral would be conducted. That would have been no problem for God. But whether he wrote it or whether Joshua wrote it, it was written about 3,500 years ago. And the entirety of the Word of God, as so many of you know, was written by about 40 men over a space and period of time of about Sixteen to eighteen hundred years with the last book being written roughly one hundred years after the death and the resurrection and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ written by the Apostle John. Now, it has been critically looked at more so, as I mentioned, than any book on the face of the earth. It is very interesting to note that Yusuf Ali, in his widely used English translation of the Koran, twice cites Sir Frederick Kenyon as a renowned authority. Kenyon, formerly the principal curator of the British Museum, was one of the world's greatest authorities on textual criticism of ancient works. I want to say that again. Kenyon was one of the world's greatest authorities on textual criticism of ancient works.
Concerning the textual reliability of the Bible, he concluded that the Christian can take the whole Bible in his hand and say without fear or hesitation that he holds in his hand the true Word of God. Concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, Harvard professor Simon Greenleaf, who together with Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story, was credited with the rise of the Harvard Law School to its eminent position. He abandoned his agnosticism only after months of careful study and heart searching, recognized as America's greatest authority on legal evidence. Greenleaf found himself logically forced to conclude after lengthy and critical examination that the literal and historical death, burial, and resurrection of Christ as the Son of God in payment of our sins was established by undeniable and overwhelming evidence. One of the most brilliant legal minds on the face of the earth. In full agreement, Professor Thomas Arnold, who holds or held the chair of modern history at Oxford, wrote, he said, I have been used for many years to study the histories of other times and to examine the weight and the evidence of those who have written about them. And I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which is proved by better and fuller evidence of every sort to the understanding of a fair inquirer than the great sign which God has given us that Jesus Christ died and rose again from the dead, which is proclaimed in the Word of God. No man ever said that he would die and come back from the dead as Jesus Christ did. Now, some mention about the many versions of the Bible. Really, that's an incorrect statement. There is only one version of the Bible. There are many translations. Our scholars argue constantly over varied translations. The King James Version, as we use that term, as I've mentioned incorrectly, is really a translation. Others have been put out. They were critical of the King James, even to the point of laboring incessantly to derive the Old Testament from the Hebrew in which it was written, minus a few verses in Aramaic, and the New Testament in Greek. Translations, some are incorrect, we think. I personally like the King James. However, the Koran has been translated as well into many languages. There have been different translations of the Koran in English, in South Africa, and Mr. Didak can correct me if I'm wrong. I think it was 1978, the Koran, one particular translation was released that was argued over and I think demanded that it be pulled from the market. So, the scholars of the Quran have the same problem of trying to pull one language over into another that we have in Christendom. It's not easy. In some languages there is even no word for what you are trying to say. So it's very, very difficult to at times come up with the perfect word to fit what was written in the ancient Hebrew or the ancient Greek, Koine Greek. There are some 24,000 manuscripts of the Word of God, of the New Testament alone, I should say, that dates back before 350 A.D. The original statement or signature or autograph of the Word of God does not exist. As I mentioned, the first one was printed on vellum or or clay tablets some 3,500 years ago. They perished from overuse and from being put on material that had little lasting quality, at least not that long. But at any rate, some 24,000 copies have been made. And scholarship tells us 
when it concerns the ancient books of antiquity, if at least ten copies are in existence, you don't have to have the original to guarantee the original. And when one considers that there are 24,000 copies and there are some variants in those copies, we admit but basically, the text is not changed. Now, there are some books, a number of them called the Apocrypha, that has not been included in Protestant Bibles. The Catholics included in theirs for reasons of their own. And the reason we do not include those so-called books in the Bible is simply because we believe they were not inspired. And when you start to study them, there are ample reasons to show why they aren't inspired. Now, Islam tells us that they believe in the Torah and the Injil. They will conclude they believe in the Torah and the Injil, but that this is not the Torah or the Injil. It is a corrupted text. And if it is a corrupted text, then our faith is vain. If it is a corrupted text, and this that I hold in my hand is not the Word of God, then multiplied multiplicities of multitudinous millions of Christians have believed in vain, lived in vain, and died in vain. They tell us that those original books given by God, the Torah, the Old Testament, the Injil, the New Testament, were lost. And I don't think anyone can tell us where they were lost or when they were lost or how they were lost. I guess I would ask this question. If God gave those two original books, the Torah and the Injil, they were God's Word as the Koran says they were. And I think any studied Muslim would guarantee that, that the Koran does say that there were books given by God Almighty other than the Koran the Torah, the Injil. Well, if God gave those books, could not God have preserved them? We Christians believe that God is omnipotent. Islam believes that God is omnipotent. And if God is omnipotent, He could have easily preserved those books without them being lost. Mohammed referred to these books quite a number of times in the Quran and in the other holy books that were written. And I submit to you tonight that the Old Testament that I hold in my hand was the same Old Testament the Jews had in the day and the time of Mohammed. It has not changed. The Injil, or the New Testament, that I hold in my hand is the same book that the church had in the days and the time of Mohammed. God did preserve it. Our faith is not in vain. I believe tonight that I can prove that it is not in vain. I'm positive that all Muslims here know it, but after the death of after the death of Mohammed, there were quite a number of versions of the Quran that were proverbially floating around, and instructions were given by Muslim doctors of religion that Caliph Uthman 
was to standardize the text. I wonder how many Muslims know that. Not long after Muhammad died. Because there were numerous texts of the Quran in existence. Now, we're not studying the Quran tonight, but I just want to throw this in. All of these contain a host of variant readings. And during his reign, reports were brought to him that in various parts of Syria, Armenia and Iraq, Muslims were reciting the Quran in a way different to that in which those in Arabia were reciting it. Uthman immediately called for the manuscript of the Quran, which was in the possession of Hafsa, if I pronounce her name correctly, one of the wives of Mohammed and the daughter of Umar, and ordered Zaid B. Thibit and three others to make copies of the text and to correct it wherever necessary. To correct it wherever necessary. When these were complete, we read that Uthman took drastic action regarding the other manuscripts of the Quran in existence. Uthman sent to every Muslim province one copy of what they had copied and ordered that all the other Quranic materials, whether written in fragmentary manuscripts or whole copies, to be burned. If they were not contradictory, I wonder why he ordered that they be burned. The only ones that's ever ordered the Bible to be burned are those that hated it. I wonder if it's ever been explained how many passages in the Quran, and it, it is a beautiful book. Literarily, it's unequal. But how many stories were plagiarized from Jewish fables and folklore? I wonder. I want to look for a moment at the alleged contradictions or variations found in the Word of God. And from this, I want to prove to you that this is the Word. In 2 Samuel 24 and 4 and 1 Chronicles 21 and 1, it mentions that God provoked David, 2 Samuel. Satan provoked David, 1 Chronicles. It seems like a contradiction. Of course, anyone that studies the Word of God knows that God is said to do things oftentimes that He only allows to be done. To be honest with you, there's evidence in the Quran that the same thing was done by God. I want to say that again. There's no contradiction here. God oftentimes, in the Old Testament especially, is placed in a position of being responsible for something when He only allows it to be done. And in reality, He is responsible, in effect, when you think of that. In 1 Kings 4 and 26, it speaks of 40,000 stalls, Solomon's grandeur. 2 Chronicles 9, 25, 4,000 stalls re relating the same incident, and we would have to think, isn't that a contradiction? It is. Plain, pure, and simple. It relates the same story. There are several incidents in the Word of God stating the same identical thing in various different ways where one account will be given and the number will be slightly changed. Another account will be given, it'll say 2,000, and then Second Chronicles or First Chronicles 3,000 or whatever. In St. John 8, verses 1 through 11, it tells the story of the woman taken in adultery. And some say that was not in the original text. It's an imposition. It's a corruption. However, the Bizet Volket, the Jerusalem Syriac, the Miphonite, and the Ethiopic, and the early church fathers say that it was in the early manuscripts. And those manuscripts, they were manuscripts and they contained them. There are some lettering in the Word of God, 2 Kings 19 and Isaiah 37, that's identical. The chapters are identical, word for word. Why? If God gave it, would He have repeated Himself? 
Why not? Jesus repeated himself at times. In the Quran, in Surah 32 and 5, it mentions a thousand years. In Surah 70 and 4, it mentions 50,000 years. A day is as a thousand years, a day is as 50,000. Is it a contradiction? Here is what I'm telling you. If this was a corrupted text, if it was an imposter, if it was fraudulent, don't you think the frauds would have removed these alleged contradictions from the Word of God? Have you ever stopped to think about that? They left it there, laboriously slaving over the text to make certain they put it exactly as the manuscript said it, translated from the Hebrew and the Greek. So what happened? If it's the Word of God, why would those contradictions be there? Well, it's a little bit simple. They didn't have Xerox copiers in those days. They didn't have computers. They had to copy them by hand. And copyists sometimes made mistakes. And I think our brothers in Islam will agree with that. And the genealogy in Matthew and Luke in Matthew, it gives Joseph's genealogy, and in Luke, it gives Mary's genealogy. In the, the, the temple in Jerusalem, if there had been anything wrong with... I'm running out of time. <laughs> okay. If there had been anything wrong with the genealogy of Christ, they would have pointed it out immediately, but they did not. This book is a book of history. It tells the given account of thousands of details concerning towns and people, and not one spade full of archaeological dirt has ever disproved one single word in it. Millions of tons Dirt and ruins have been removed and not one single, single archaeological spade has ever disproved one word in it. Secondly, it's a book of prophecies, thousands and thousands of prophecies. And they come true. I want to close with this one thing. I've got about three minutes. And I only got about a third what I was trying to say. I'd never met this man before this evening. I read his little book that he wrote. And Mr. Dot, I will admit, I, I was a little bit taken aback. I expected a little more courtesy. And I, I don't mean our meeting today, I mean the little booklet. And I was grieved inside. Saturday night I went to our church to pray. And I started to pray about this meeting. And uh, I believe the Lord spoke to my heart. And you're older than I am, and I will show you the respect that your age and your scholarship most definitely and certainly deserves. The Lord, I believe, spoke to my heart and said, You tell this distinguished gentleman this. There was another man 2,000 years ago, Saul of Tarsus, who didn't like Christians. And I think you know the story. Saul met Jesus on the road to Damascus as one out of due time. And Jesus asked him, why do you kick against the goads? And I believe our Heavenly Father asked me to ask you, why do you, 
and I say it with reverence and respect, kick against the greatest prophet, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, you tell Mr. Didot, if it was God that spoke to me, I love him very, very much, for I am a God of love. And tell him if he will give his heart to me, I will fill the loneliness and the ache and the void within his heart. And I will give him a love for the Muslim people that he has never known before in all of his life. And I'll close this little one-third finished statement by saying, we love you, and God loves you, and God bless you. Brother Ahmed did that. Auzu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa wailul lil ladina yaktubun al-kitab bi aydihim, thumma yakulun haza min indi Allah liyashtru bihi thamanan kalila. وويل لهم مما كتبت أيديهم وويل لهم مما يكسبون صدق الله صدق الله من الرزيق. Mr. Chairman and brethren, though I wanted to go straight into the subject, the plea that Brother Swagat had made forces me to make a confession of faith, and that is that we Muslims. Happen to be the of the only non-Christian faith, which makes it an article of faith for its followers to believe in Jesus. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus. We believe that Jesus Christ was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe. We believe that he was the Messiah. We believe in his miraculous birth, which many modern-day Christians reject today. We believe that he gave life to the dead by God's permission, and he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. We are going together. The only parting of the ways, the only real difference between the Muslim and the Christian is that we say that he is not God Almighty in human form, he is not God incarnate, and he is not the begotten Son of God. Metaphorically, we are all the children of God, the good and the bad. And Jesus would be closer to being the Son of God than any one of us, because he would be more faithful to God than any of us can ever be. From that point of view, we would agree that he is most preeminently the Son of God. But not as the Christians say, that he is the only begotten son, begotten, not made, not in that sense. Coming to the subject, the subject is, is the Bible God's word? And Brother Swagat has given us to understand that translations and versions are one and the same thing. We Muslims, we have a number of translations of the Quran even into the English language. Different people, Yusuf Ali, Mamidu Pikthol, you know, Darya Badi, and so on and on. We have English translations by different people. And there, the translation means a difference in the choice of words. Choice of words in translating a certain phrase from Arabic into English. Choice of words. Versions are quite a different thing. Look, here, I have in my hand this Bible, which Brother Swagat, as well as many Protestants, do not accept as the Word of God. 
This is the Roman Catholic version of the Bible. The Douay or Reims version of the Bible. This Bible has 73 books. This is an encyclopedia of 73 books. Seven more than one uh, which Brother Swagger takes oath on. The King James Version. This is the King James Version. He takes oath by it. In his Evangelist magazine, December 1985, somebody questions Brother Swaggart about the Bible being the Word of God. And he says, Word of God, and in bracket, I refer to the King James Version. In your Evangelist of December 85, the King James Version. The King James Version has thrown out those seven extra books. Thrown out. In other words, those seven extra books the, Christ, the Protestants do not accept as the word of God. You use certain technical terms like, like apocrypha, which the masses of Christendom do not know. What is this apocrypha? Apocrypha means doubtful, weak, not deserve to be in the book of God. As such, the Protestants threw it out as a fabrication. These seven books are thrown out from here. So this version, the Christian Protestants will not accept as the word of God. Am I correct? This is not the word of God. So we put it aside. I agree with you. What you tell me, I accept. You say it's not the word of God. I say I agree with you and I put it aside. Now you tell me that this is the word of God. The King James Version. With his 66 books. This was first published in 1611. By order of His Majesty King James whose name is still based today. Authorized version, authorized by who? Not God Almighty, by King James. He authorized it. Not God Almighty. Now, it goes back to the ancient manuscripts. I'm told, what is ancient? It says four to six hundred years after Jesus is ancient. Now we have access to the most ancient manuscripts. Most ancient. And this translation here, or version, the RSV, the Revised Standard Version, goes to the most ancient manuscripts. They date from two to three hundred years after Jesus. So closer to the source, the more authentic any document would be, closer to the source. This is common sense. If Jesus, in the time of Jesus, if this was written and he had signed it, autographed it, shh, no questions asked. This is two to three hundred years after, this is four to six hundred years after. So they published this translation, published in your own country here, as well as in Britain, Canada, all these countries, simultaneously you produce this Bible. And we are told some glowing tributes are being paid to this translation. It says here, Church of England newspaper says that the finest version which has been produced in the present century, this one, the finest version. Times Literary Supplement says a complete, a completely fresh translation by scholars of the highest eminence. Fullest use of the resources of modern scholarship. Life and Works, another publication says, the well-loved characteristics of the authorized version combined with the new accuracy of translation. New accuracy. And the Times, the Times of UK, England says, the most accurate and close rendering of the original. They, these publishers of this Bible, the one who got it about first in 1952, they pay some glowing tributes to the King James Version. And I would be disrespectful or failing in my duty if I didn't read those tributes out to you. Why Brother Swaggart loves it and I myself. In every quotation that I will give, I will be quoting from the King James Version. I love the language. Only that now they are doing away with certain terms and expressions. It is not suiting the Christians of the time today. Like for example the quotation my brother Swaggart ended with where Paul on the Damascus road, a persecutor of the early Christians going to Damascus and he sees a vision in which Jesus Christ appears to him 
and speaks to him in the Hebrew language. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Why kickest thyself against the pricks? This is the exact quotation from the King James Version. Which brother, Swagat, I don't know why, he used the word gold. I have been asking Christians what is gold and nobody knows what is gold. I said, why do you change the words? If it's pricks, it should be said pricks. If this is the original language of the King James Version. But now, it's talking about goads, goads. I haven't heard that word before in my life. It's a, it's a new word. It's a new terminology coming out. Changing the words. The translation. I'm still not taking exception to that. Goads. So they say about the King James Version, the revisers of the Revised Standard Version, 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations, that the King James Version has with good reason been termed, been termed the noblest monument of English prose. Its revisers in 1881 expressed admiration for its simplicity, its dignity, the music, uh, its power, its happy terms of expression, the music of its cadences, and the felicities of its rhythm. It entered as no other book has into the making of the personal character and the public institutions of the English-speaking peoples. Said so we owe to it, we owe to it an incalculable debt, the English-speaking peoples. The Americans, the Canadians, the British, and people like me who have adopted English as our mother tongue, I speak English better than any other language. It's not as good as Brother Swagard's, but English happens to be my mother tongue because I dream in English and I swear in English. That makes it my mother tongue, according to the psychologists. <laughs> now, this is the tribute. If somebody paid such a tribute to the Quran, I can't imagine a Muslim scholar bettering it. Now, prepare for the shock. I said, prepare for the shock from these 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations. They say, yet the King James Version has grave defects. And that these defects are so many and so serious. They are, these are not my words. They are so, they are so many and so serious as to call for revision in the English translation calls for revision, and they revised it. And in the revision, the kingpin of the evangelist, the preacher, the hot gospeler, the Bible thumper, John 3.16. No Christian preacher is worth the name if he can't clinch the deal with John 3.16. John 3.16, for God so loved the world, in the authorized King James Version, that he gave his only begotten son. My brother Swagga changed the word begotten to unique. This is not from the King James Version. The King James Version <laughs> says begotten. I heard brother Swagga on TV, or was it video? This morning, this morning, there he's speaking to a group as if it was his own church group, you know, giving some lessons on Babylon. I think it was on that or another one. He used the word begotten this morning. And in eight hours' time, he changed it to unique. <laughs> I'm asking, are you ashamed of the word begotten? Are you ashamed of it, that Jesus is the only begotten son? And Brother Swaggart, in one of these 30 books that I had to purchase in South Africa before coming, these are his books. More than 30 I purchased, and I went through each and every one of them. I had to. I want to know what my brother is talking about. What, is he, what does he really believe in? Because generally when you speak to a Christian, he, every Christian happens to be unique, absolutely unique. As soon as you corner him somewhere, he says, but I don't believe in that. As soon as you corner him somewhere, he says, I don't believe in that. And everyone of this thousand million. Anyone I meet, he's unique. Everyone is unique. He belongs to the Church of England, but he doesn't, you know, believe in what the Church of England teaches. He belongs to the Roman Catholic Church, but he doesn't really believe what the Roman Catholic Church teaches. Everyone is unique. So I said, now let me see now, what does he say in black and white? 
And in black and white, I found that he uses this John 3.16. And in his quotation, in his book, he says, begotten. Tonight, he says, unique. Can you see the reason? The reason is obvious. The Muslims have been taking exception to this term. In the Holy Quran, we are told, Lam yalid wa lam yulad, that God Almighty, He does not beget and is not begotten. And there is nothing like unto Him. Walam yakullahu kufan ahad. Then again, in very strong terms, the Quran condemns this idea that God begot a son, because begetting is an animal act. It belongs to the lower animal functions of sex, and we are not to attribute such a quality to God. As the Christian says in his catechism, he says, Jesus is the only begotten son, begotten, not made. And I have been asking Christians, please explain, what are you really trying to emphasize when you say begotten, not made? What are you really trying to tell me? And believe me, in 40 years, no Englishman with the name has opened his mouth to me to explain to me what this word means, begotten. It had to be an American. It had to be an American. He was on a visit to Durban and he came on a guided tour of the mosque and I happened to be a guide. And discussing, it came up, I said, now what does it mean? What are you trying to tell me? What, is, what does it mean to say begotten, not made? He said, it means, this American tells me, it means sired by God. I said, what? He said, no, 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 I don't say that. This is what it means. And believe me, that is what it means. Begotten, not made, means sired by God. I said, is that what you believe that God did? He said, no, I didn't say that. This is what it means. So the Muslim has taken strong exception to such an expression about God, that God begot a son. It's according to your language, your catechism. The Roman Catholic catechism, the Anglican catechism, the Methodist catechism, the Lutheran catechism. You accept this. This statement, begotten, not made. So not like Adam. Adam was made by God. Every dog, pig, and donkey was made by God. As such, metaphorically, metaphorically he's the father of everything. But he said, no, Jesus is not like that. He's begotten, not made. I said, please explain. And no explanation. So this was something which the Muslims took exception to. And the 32 scholars of the highest eminence backed by 50 cooperating denominations, they threw it out to appease us. Did the Muslims threaten you that, look, if you don't take that word out of the Bible, we won't supply you oil? Did they do that, the Arabs? Did they tell you no oil if you don't take this word out from the Bible? Why did you take it out? Because it was an interpolation. It was not the word of God. The Bible you are carrying, it has this interpolation. And you said this morning, I heard the tape, he said, one word, even one word. He says, if it is not supposed to be there and it's there, he said, the whole book should be thrown away. Whole book. But it's not only one word. There are chunks and chunks of it, according to your revisers. And Brother Swagat tells me in one of his books, that if you want to know anything factual, knowledge, on any subject, you go to the experts. And he gives an example that if you want to know something about geology, you go to the geologist. If you want to know about the Bible, where do you go? To the barber, shoemaker? No, you go to the Bible experts, the Bible scholars, and they are telling you that this is a fabrication. Then, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Brother Swagat also quotes ad verbatim from the first episode of John, chapter 5, verse 7, where it says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. If he gives me time, he said, Now look, which book? I can open it and show it to you. Which book? Ad verbatim, his quotation. I said, Look, but it's not in my Bible. Is this not the Word of God? In my Bible, it's not there. Why is it not there? Because your scholars, 32 scholars of the highest eminence, Bible scholars, backed by 50 cooperating denominations, they say this is a, another fabrication, another interpolation. So they also threw it out without any ceremony. So, two. And I give you the ascension. Brother Swaggart quotes in his book, Mark chapter 16, 
verse 16 another place mark chapter 16 verse 19 i say it's not in my bible i didn't print this the jews didn't print it the hindus didn't print it you christians you produce this book and you are telling me that this is the most up-to-date bible going to the most ancient manuscripts so i look up for Mark chapter 16, I see it ends at verse 8. 9 to 20 is missing. Did I take it out? The Muslims took it out? No. 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 corporate denominations, they thought it fit that this is another fabrication imposed upon Christendom. And they also threw it out. It's not in my Bible. Therefore, it is not the word of God. If this is the word of God, then that is not the word of God. But I pick up another Bible. Look at this. Look at these two. Brother Swagar, I didn't take them. Look at that. I see back again. It's inside. What was thrown out? The ascension. There are only two places in, in the Gospels. In the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are only two places where ascension is mentioned. Mark chapter 16, verse 19. Luke chapter 24, verse 51. Thrown out of this version. Thrown out. As fabrication. Ascension. And yet these Bibles, each and every one of them, they tell us that Jesus, when he went to Jerusalem, he rode the donkey into Jerusalem, Matthew says. Mark says he rode the donkey into Jerusalem. Luke says he rode the donkey into Jerusalem. John says he rode the donkey into Jerusalem. Look, God Almighty didn't miss that out. His son riding the donkey into Jerusalem. When every Tom, Dick and Harry was riding donkeys into Jerusalem. That he didn't forget. But the ascension is not mentioned not once. And where it is mentioned is now thrown out. But I buy another Bible, identical Bible. That's to the look. Printed by the same printers. I look, and it's there again. What was thrown out, they put it back again. How come? How come? What games are you people playing? Look at this. Back again. This is the 1971 version. Back again. The ordinary people, poor people, they don't know what's going on. What game is being played? Who knows? You read the preface. The learned man, the preacher, he reads the preface, but he won't tell his congregation what he's reading in the preface. In the preface we are told that individuals and two church denominations, they stampeded them, they forced them that they should put it back. If not, they're going to preach against this book to say, look, don't buy this, buy the King James Version. Don't buy this, buy the King James, the most up-to-date Bible going to the most ancient manuscripts. No, 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 don't touch that. This is the safer one, because it has everything that you want to preach, to catch the fish. It's easier to catch the fish with this than with this, the bait. You know, the fish, you know, uses, like Dale Carnegie, he tells us in his book, how to, uh, says, how to win friends and inf influence people. He says, I like strawberry and cream. I think most Americans do. But he says, when I go fishing, I put a worm, worm to catch the fish. It's not that I love worms, but this is what the fish loves. So I put worm. So now, if you want to catch fish, you've got to use the right bait. Ascension is now restored to the text, says the preface. Why? Not God told them so. God doesn't speak freely to those scholars, as freely as he happens to speak, as brother claims, with him. You know, again and again you read, God comes to him, speaks to him, and he says, Son, again, Son, which he didn't address his own son, Jesus, in inverted commas. He never called him son. He speaks in the third person. He says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. But to Brother Swagad, he says, my son, my son, not so freely. So I says, look, this is not the word of God. We say, playing, they said that the church groups, and they, by the meantime, while this was being discovered, they made a net profit of $15 million on this version before they could remove it. $15 million. Brother Swagat has written some beautiful books. Beautiful books. Incest. Pornography. Homosexuality. Alcohol. 
Sodom and Gomorrah. And I can't imagine myself doing any better. Beautiful writings. Incest. This is the dark stain on our society, American society. The dark stain on American society. It has reached epidemic proportions. Incest. In my country, the whites of South Africa, according to statistics, 8% of all white people, they commit incest. 8%, one in every 12, is committing incest. I don't know what's the percentage here, but Brother Swaggart tells us that it has reached epidemic proportions in your mighty country, America. And he gives examples from the Holy Bible that there are 10 cases of incest in the Holy Bible. I didn't know that. I knew that in the first book of the Bible, Genesis, there were four cases. Brother Swagart's book enlightens me, I got the fifth one in the first book. As if this is a textbook on incest, to tell you what, what types of incest you can commit. In the book of God, ten cases of incest. And I'm told that the type of food you eat, you eat junky food, you become a junkie. You read junky stuff, your mind becomes junky. This type of things you read. Can't you see we are getting programmed? Whatever you see, whatever you read, we are getting programmed. You read about incest, incest, incest. Father with his daughters, son with his mother. Father-in-law with his daughter-in-law. Brother with his sister. What is this? Ten cases of incest. You read about incest, incest, incest. Little wonder that it has reached epidemic proportions. You see, Dr. Vernon Jones, an, uh, an American psychologist of great repute, he carried out experiments on groups of school children to whom certain stories were being read. And he said that these stories made certain slight but permanent changes in character, even in the narrow classroom situation. The type of stories that you read, the type of stories that they read, the things that they see, that is the type of mentality they're going to have. So I said, Book of God, why would God Almighty go out of His way in His holy book to reveal to you ten cases of incest coupling? Ten cases. So I said, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, this is not the word of God. The first five books, supposed to be the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. These revisers, scholars of the highest eminence, they are telling us today that Moses didn't write the books. He didn't write the books. He's not the author. He's the author, Genesis, author, the first book of Moses in inverted commas. Exodus, second book of Moses in inverted commas. Leviticus, third book of Moses in inverted commas. Numbers, fourth book of Moses in inverted commas. Deuteronomy, fifth book of Moses in inverted commas. I'm asking why the inverted commas? What for? Why these inverted commas? They are telling you in a very, very diplomatic, psychological way that these are not our words, we don't believe so, but the common man, the laity, the preachers, the Bible thumpers, the hot gospelers, this is what they believe that these are the books of Moses, but Moses didn't write them. We don't believe that these are his words, so we put them in inverted commas. It's not the book of Moses. There are more than 700 times in these five books, you read the expression, and the Lord said unto Moses, and Moses said unto the Lord, and the Lord said unto Moses, and Moses said unto the Lord. Neither the Lord said this, nor did Moses write it. English, this is your language. This is written in the third person. Not by God, not by Moses. If Moses wrote it, he would have said, The Lord said unto me, and I said unto the Lord. The Lord, I, or the Lord says, I said unto Moses, and Moses said unto me. This is in the third person, and that somebody else is writing about these things. It is not the word of God. It is not even the words of Moses. With regards to the obituary, I found out from Jewish scholars, that Jewish prophets didn't write the obituaries. You know, before dying, he says, you know, on my tombstone, you put these words, epitaphs. Jews didn't do that. 
In the book of Deuteronomy it says, my brother admits that it could be the works of Joshua. But they are supposed to be the books of Moses. How does Joshua fit in? It says, and there Moses died in the land of Moab. Died in the past tense. Over against Beth Peer. And no man knoweth of his sepulcher unto this day. And Moses was, he was 120 years old when he died. Of course, God can do anything. God can do anything. In an explanation about the contradictions in the Bible, whether Satan provoked David or the Lord provoked David, he said, look, this is, we attribute it to God. That though the devil did it, we say God did it. On that basis, would we be prepared to concede that God had those six million Jews incinerated because Hitler did it? We say because God intended it, this is what he wanted to do. So God is responsible for the massacre or the incineration of 6 million Jews or even 600,000 or even 6,000 is dramatic enough. If, they, if Hitler did it, could he say God did it? Are you going to blame God for that? You're going to exonerate Hitler and the Nazi party because they said God did it? No, dear brother Swagat, we don't think like that. If a criminal does such and such a thing, we say it is his action, he's responsible. We don't say God did it. Because eventually the power comes from God, but God has given you that free will to think and, and to see right from wrong. So if you do wrong, you are responsible. You can't hold God responsible. So either David was provoked by the Satan or by the Lord. And Satan and Lord are not synonymous terms in any religion. They are opposites. Satan and the God Almighty are opposite things. Pornography. Very strong. Brother Swagat is very strong in his condemnation. And I am with him. Pornography. Any type, whether in written form, whether in pictures or in films. It's a horrible thing. In his book, Brother Swagat gives you his research, his study. Number one, he says, when you read or you see these things, it acts like a drug. Like, like marijuana or opium or heroin or alcohol, it acts like a drug. You see these things, it's a chemical action takes place. And I agree with Brother Swagat. Chemical action takes place. You know? So you read about ins up with pornography. Pornography. Your mind is getting used to that. Escalation takes place. Desensitization takes place. These are his terms. Huh? Uh, these are the fir first time I'm learning these terms. And you must then play the role, act out the role. This is how this sickness, this disease overpowers man. Strong in his condemnation. He is closest to my government in South Africa because if I take any of some of the magazines that I can buy, at Kennedy Airport or at Heathrow, anywhere, if I take it into my country, I go to jail for two years. That's how good. That's my country, South Africa. You know, it has its, you know, this, the other side of the picture. But as far as religion goes, as far as religiosity goes, they are very, very strong Christians. But that country of mine banned portions of the Bible. There was a pamphlet in circulation with extracts, nine extracts from the Holy Bible. And somebody sent it to the censorship board. I said, look at this. What is this? So they made a decree that this pamphlet is banned. Not knowing that these are words from the Holy Bible. These were extracts from the Holy Bible. From the book of Ezekiel, chapter 23. I dare any preacher read it to read it to his congregation. I dare any evangelist to read it to his mother, his sister, his daughter, or even to his fiance if she's a good woman. Ezekiel, chapter 23. The hordons of those two sisters. Ahola and Aholiba. The language, the language. So it. My government banned it. And there were two ministers of the church on the board when they banned it. But they didn't know they were banning extracts from the Holy Bible. My government is so staunch that they had banned Lady Chatterley's Lover. It's a novel, Lady Chatterley's Lover. It had one offensive word, four letter word, one word for which they banned it for 20 years. But now they've grown big, they're mature now, they have allowed it. You know, they have desensitized it, they have withdrawn that uh, 
that order against the book. But nine extracts from the Holy Bible, say, the book of God, which you are ashamed to read to your audience, I dare my brother, I dare him to read this pamphlet. I have it here ready. He doesn't have to even open the book. Here, all those wordings in red, I said, look, with your usual, your usual charismatic language, with the usual actions, I would love to see Brother Swagat. I, I, I feel ashamed to bribe him. I said, look, Brother Swagat, if you can read it to the audience, I give you a hundred dollars. What is a hundred dollars to Brother Swagat? <laughs> when I'm reading in his book on Roman Catholicism, that he needs $291,000 a day to keep his head above water. I calculated 106 million a year just to keep above water. And in the evangelist of December 85, he's aspiring, I wish him luck, he's aspiring for $1 million a day. He needs, he says, $1 million a day. It's a good luck to him. But now, <laughs> if I said I'll give you a thousand, brother sir, God, I'll give you a thousand. You know, I can't tempt him, I know. But in his usual spirited way, I hope and I pray that he has the courage, the guts, which all the priests in my experience have not had. Read it. Read it to your audience. Ezekiel chapter 23. If you can't, and I'm, I can tell you that it is not the word of God. The Bible is not the word of God. Yes, as some mention men, men, uh, was made, it was from my book, Is the Bible God's Word? I had some 10,000 sent to the city, and I think they're available. I don't know whether they'll be given out here. I had instructed them, give to everybody. Let them go home and look at it themselves and read for themselves and make up their own minds. In this book, contradiction. The Quran tells us, Afalayat al Quran. al-Quran, he said, do they not consider the Quran with care? Had it been from anyone other than Allah, you would have found in it many discrepancies, many contradictions. The Quran is not involved this evening, but this is what the Quran says, that if this is not the word of God, you will find in any book claiming to be from God, that book will be free from contradictions. Like for example, the example the brother gave, I repeat that. I said, look, it says in one of the books, Solomon had 4,000 stalls of horses. Another one says he had 40,000 stalls of horses. And 4 in 40 is only the difference of a zero. So you say, I said, you know, my cousins, the Jews, they didn't know the zero when they wrote the book. They didn't know. It's my Arab brothers who found it from my fathers in India and they shared it to the world, zero. The Jews didn't know. They wrote this in words. Four, F-O-U-R, four. In Hebrew, of course. Forty, F-O-R-T-Y, forty. I said, now who made the mistake? God or the writer? And they were not saved. We are told that they were not saved from mistakes. Mrs. Ellen G. White, you say she's a cultist, Mrs. Ellen G. White, the prophetess of the Seventh-day Adventist movement. In her Bible commentary, she says, she has no motives to lie. She believes in the Bible to be the inspired word of God. And yet she says, so the Bible we, have re we read today is the work of many copyists who have in most instances done the work with marvelous accuracy. In most instances, she, they have done their work with marvelous accuracy. But copies have not been infallible. And God most and God most evidently has not seen fit to preserve them altogether from error. God didn't see fit. In other words, this is, this is his business, God's business. If he wants to see fit, if he wants to do a thing, he does it. If he doesn't, he says, go to hell. That's your business. He said, God didn't see fit to preserve them from making errors in transcribing. In the following pages of her commentary, Mrs. White testifies further, I saw that God had specially guarded the Bible. God had specially guarded the Bible. I'm asking for what? Yet, when copies of it were few, learned men had in some instances changed the words in the original manuscripts. They changed the words, thinking that they were making it plain, when in reality they were mystifying that which was plain. 
by causing it to lean to the established views which were governed by tradition, like the Jehovah's Witnesses. They have produced a translation called the New World Translation. The Orthodox, you don't accept that. Why don't you? Because they have their own leanings. According to their own ideas, they are changing the world. Same thing that the Protestants did. They were people who believed in Jesus as God. So they said, now, they changed the world. So we said, this is, has been going on from the very beginning. The boast about 24,000 manuscripts. Brother Swagat, you know, no two are identical. Your scholars say, out of the 24,000 that you are boasting about, no two are identical. Then how do you come to know that this is the word of God and this is not, out of the 24,000? On the very face of it, when you open the book, the Injil and the Torah you're talking about, it says Mark, um, Matthew begins, in your version, the King James Version, it says, the gospel according to St. Matthew, the gospel according to St. Mark, the gospel according to St. Luke, the gospel according to St. John. I am asking, what is this according, according, according? What is this according to? Why according to? I have got Brother Swagger's book. It says, you know, homosexuality, its cause and its cure by Jimmy Swagger or just Jimmy Swaggart. It doesn't say according to Jimmy Swaggart. Why this in the book of God? According to, according to, according to, according to. You know why? Because Matthew didn't sign his name, Luke didn't sign his name, John didn't sign, Mark didn't sign his name, John didn't sign his name. These are assumed anonymous books. Anonymous books. Attributed to God. I said, this is not the Injil. You see, even in your Arabic translations of these books, Arabic translations, it says, Injile Matthew, means the Gospel of Matthew, Injil is used. Injile Marcus, Injile Lucas, Injile Johanna. The one we believe in is Injile Isa, the Gospel of Jesus, what he preached. That is what we believe in as from God. And the scripture. When you look at these books, Matthew, Mark, it says these are the Injil or the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We believe in the Gospel of Jesus, the one that he preached. And we are told by Matthew that he went to a certain place and he preached the Gospel. Mark says he went to a certain other place and he preached the Gospel. Luke says he went to a certain place and he preached the Gospel. John says he went to another place and he preached the Gospel. I said, did he have a book under his arm? Did he have a book under his arm? No. Whatever he preached was from God. That is what we believe in. If you can produce a document called Injile Isa, the Gospel of Jesus, we would be very happy to give it a recognition to find out and verify whether it is from God and accept it as such. But what you have is Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and J.B. Phillips, a prebendary of the Chichester Cathedral in England, a paid servant of the Anglican Church. When writing about Matthew, in his preface, he says, early tradition ascribed this gospel to the Apostle Matthew. Early tradition. That's what people said. But scholars nowadays almost all reject this view. Which scholars? Jewish scholars? Hindu scholars? Muslim scholars? No. Christian scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations, they say that Matthew didn't write Matthew. They say... He said, the author whom we may still conveniently call Matthew. Conveniently. Why conveniently? Because instead of me telling you the first book of the New Testament, chapter 9, verse 9, the first book of the New Testament, chapter 5, verse 17, I'm wasting your time and minds too. So he says, no. I said, Matthew 9, 9, Matthew 5, 17, conveniently, I'm using the term Matthew. He said, the author whom we may still conveniently call Matthew has plainly drawn on the mysterious Q, again in inverted commas. That stands for the German word quella, sources, which might have been a collection of oral traditions. He has used Mark's gospel freely. In the language of the school teacher, he was copying wholesale from Mark. Matthew, an eyewitness and a ear witness to the happenings with Jesus, one of his disciples, his apostles. He goes and copies a 10 year old boy who wasn't there. Does it make sense to you? A man with an eyewitness and a ear witness, a companion of Jesus. He goes and copies a 10-year-old boy who wasn't there. Does it make sense to you? 
and you say this is the word of God. The genealogy between Matthew and Luke, we are given 66 fathers and grandfathers to Jesus. In a genealogy of 66 fathers and grandfathers, except for one name, no two names are identical. Separate list, everyone is a different name. Brother Swaggart says, one is the genealogy of Mary and one of Jesus. I say, why of Mary? Does the book say that? No. The book says this is the genealogy of Jesus Christ. The other one ends with Jesus Christ. There's no Mary inside. 66 names, no two are alike except one. And the father of Jesus Christ, allegedly, God Almighty, he's not there. Can you imagine? God Almighty dictating the genealogy of his son in inverted commas. And yet he leaves himself out. He is going out of his way to dictate two genealogies with 66 names and he is not in it. He is not there. I am asking what is he trying to tell you? What is he really trying to tell you? When his name is not there. A man who had no genealogy, we believe. No genealogy. He was born miraculously, without any male intervention. You give him 66 fathers and grandfathers and you say this is God Almighty dictated. We Muslims, Brother Swagat, we take strong exception to this type of handling of this mighty messenger of God. We say he was a mighty messenger of God. He was born miraculously. The Holy Quran testifies to that. It has made a thousand million Muslims in the world today without any, any kind of proof from the Christians to believe that Jesus Christ was born miraculously. And he was the Messiah. He was the word which God bestowed upon Mary. I will be dealing with this subject tomorrow night as Muhammad, the natural successor to Christ. And I'll be open to further questions besides the questions this evening. So with these words, Mr. Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, I am very, very grateful to the community here for creating such an opportunity for me to share the platform with the, the greatest charismatic speaker in the world today, Brother Jimmy Swaggart. I think it's a privilege and honor for me. And now, for 10 minutes, Reverend Jimmy Swaggart. I look at the Bibles that Mr. Didat has, and from the Quran, Surah, what we call chapter 62 and 5, it says, as the likeness of the ass carrying books, as the donkey is unaware of the value of the load on its back, so some men are ignorant of the spiritual treasure they hold in their hands. What does the Bible produce? That is the ironclad evidence, what it produces. I was in Africa a short time ago and I was with a group of ministers and I was being introduced to them and speaking with them and I asked, or I didn't ask him, but he was asked, how did you become a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ? You see, Jesus cannot be the Messiah and a great prophet and a liar at the same time. He is either who he said he was, or he's a liar. And he's not a liar. Amen. He said, this is the way I became a minister of the gospel. He said, one of my closest friends was a Christian. We argued incessantly over Islam and Christianity. One day, the young Christian said, there's a demon-possessed man, you know, in St. John, I'm sorry, St. Mark, chapter 16 in verse 17, it says, in my name they'll cast out devils. This is a book of power. Millions upon millions have been healed by the power of God by invoking that mighty name of Jesus. Millions have been changed instantly 
from the worst bondages that hell could ever produce, such as he mentioned. <laughs> By the power of the word of Almighty God, I remind you that no dead book could produce those type of results. You can go in our church, and over half the people there were former alcoholics, drug addicts, every bondage that hell could muster. And I know your religion of Islam believes in hell, but tonight they are free by the power of Almighty God, set free in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ produces results. It breaks the bondages of sin. It fills the empty heart. He said, we went, I went with him. He was going to pray for this man, demon possessed, a maniac. He said, when we arrived, he was frothing at the mouth. He said, I've never seen anything like it. And he said, my friend prayed for him with no visible results. And he went to get another minister, and I was left alone with this maniac. And he said, I think I will pray for him myself. And he said he prayed in the name of Mohammed, come out of him. I ask you, what happened? Nothing. He prayed several times in the name of Mohammed, come out of it. But nothing. And I do not mean that disrespectfully of Mohammed. He could have prayed in the name of Abraham or Moses, and it would have done no better. He could have prayed in the name of Paul or Peter, and it would have done no better. So standing there alone, he says, I think I'll try it. My Christian friend has said it. I don't believe it, but I'm going to try it. He laid hands on him. In the name of Jesus Christ, come out of him. He said, Brother Swaggart, before my eyes, he was delivered by the power of Almighty God. I know that you do not deny the miracles of Jesus. But I remind you as I close this, a dead man cannot produce miracles. I want to say it again, a dead man cannot produce miracles. Jesus Christ is alive. got two minutes. He said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. One day very soon, you see, He's promised to come back. He's coming. Because he said he would come. Every single prophecy in this book that is supposed to be fulfilled has been fulfilled. The others that have not yet been fulfilled will be fulfilled. There is a hunger in the heart of every person for God. Only Jesus Christ can fill that hunger because God is love. He loves you. This book says He is. He loves you in spite of the sin and the iniquity. He loves you and He wants to make Himself real to you. He's not distant, far away, unapproachable. But through Jesus Christ, you can approach Him and love Him and worship Him and He will love you. Because his book says that he does. Thank you.
Let us acknowledge both these fine gentlemen. Let us acknowledge both of them. Almost, Muslims are truthful. <laughs> <laughs>